Screening people for diabetes and then preventing them from getting it is a no-brainer, right? I wish. This is Healthcare Triage News. Just over a year ago, we released a video arguing about how frustrated I was that the USPSDF had determined that universally screening children for autism could only receive an I rating. That I rating means that they felt that there wasn't enough data to really make an informed choice and that we need to go out and do more research. I felt that the I rating, which again asked for more research, ignored the vast amount we already knew about autism. Specifically, I cited the four questions I usually ask when considering, and those I adapted from David Sackett's classic handbook on evidence-based medicine. One, is the condition prevalent and severe enough to warrant screening? Two, do we have a cost-effective means to screen the general population? Three, does early diagnosis make a difference? That is, do we have treatments available that are more successful when patients are diagnosed earlier? And four, will an early diagnosis motivate people to use information that they gain from screening? When it comes to autism, I argued that all four criteria were satisfied. In the last year, however, I've been convinced that perhaps the USPSTF may have been right. We could use research to know that the actual universal screening of kids would make a difference over what doctors might do naturally. But an area that I thought wasn't even close to debate was diabetes. That is until now. To the research. From the BMJ, Efficacy and Effectiveness of Screen and Treat Policies and Prevention of Type 2 Diabetes, Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Screening Tests and Interventions. This study was a systematic review that looked at the accuracy of tests which are used to identify prediabetes, and then the efficacy of the interventions we use to prevent diabetes in people with prediabetes. The latter accepted randomized controlled trials or interventional studies that had a control group of people identified through screening. This seemed like a no-brainer to me. Given the plethora of studies on diabetes tests, as well as programs for preventing diabetes, I thought this would clearly show positive results. I was wrong. The final analysis included 49 studies of screening tests. They found that hemoglobin A1c had an overall sensitivity of 49% and an overall specificity of 79% for identifying prediabetes. Different studies use different cutoff values though, which made analyses tricky. Of course, this makes publishing guidelines on how to use the test to screen even trickier. Fasting plasma glucose had a sensitivity of 25% and a specificity of 94%. You have to remember though that when you're screening, you want sensitivity first. The test didn't really correlate either. Almost half the people with an abnormal hemoglobin A1c didn't have any other glycemic abnormalities. The interventions, on the other hand, at least showed some good news. They were associated with a reduction in the relative risk of developing type 2 diabetes of more than a third over six months to six years, depending on the study. Even in the follow-up period after the studies were done, the relative risk reduction was 20%. Here's the thing, though. You can't even get to the four questions about screening programs until you have a screening test you trust. We don't appear to have that. Fasting plasma glucose was specific but not sensitive, making it a poor choice for a screening test. Plus, it's much harder to get people to do that. Hemoglobin A1c, which is much easier to use, is neither sensitive nor specific. That means that it's both missing people who have prediabetes and putting people who don't into interventions they may not need. Since more intervention programs try and get people to adopt healthier lifestyles, there's little harm in getting them to eat better and be more active. Some trials put people on metformin though, and that does come with side effects. They all involve costs too. Diabetes is such a big public health issue though, and the prevention measures are so holistic, with the exception of metformin, that we might do better to focus on public health efforts that hit everyone. Collectively trying to get people to maintain a healthy weight, not smoke, and exercise may be cost effective. Unfortunately though, it appears that our current plans to screen and then treat may wind up doing much less good. Healthcare Triage is supported in part by viewers like you through Patreon.com, a service that allows you to support the show through a monthly donation. Your support makes this show bigger and better. We'd especially like to thank our research associate, Joe Sevitz, and thank our Surgeon Admiral, Sam. More information can be found at Patreon.com slash Healthcare Triage.